We're finishing this week, he said, by faith. Back to basics. What is a Christian and what does a Christian do? All we've said throughout this series is that if we claim to be a Christian, then our lives need to somehow show that. Does it mean we'll be perfect? I don't know any who are. But I do know that he's promised to bring us per to perfection. And that he's promised to forgive us when we fail. Amen? And to renew us until he makes it so. And until then, there are some things we need to do, and we're going to just go right through these down to right here. We left off last week here. Christians birthed by faith. We're not birthed by our good works. We're not Christians because we do everything right. We're not... Know any other good jokes? Some of you got that, okay. Uh, we're not Christians because... Uh, somehow we earn the grace and the mercy of God. No, it's free to every sinner who walks the planet, and that includes me and you. He gives us His grace. He saves us, causes us to be born again into the kingdom of God, gives us eternal life, and now we're king's kids. And we have the promise from Him that He will live in us and through us. So Titus 3, 5, and 6 says, God has not saved us, uh, excuse me, God has saved us not because of the righteous works that we have done, uh, but according to his mercy and uh, uh, by the washing away of our sins in his blood, which we celebrated this morning through communion, giving us new birth and a new life by our work. Is that what it says? No, it says, by the work of the Holy Spirit. Okay. So, we come down to this, and I think we left off with this one actually last week. What is the proof of our Christianity? Now, we're saved by faith. doesn't make any difference who you are, what your name is, you know, whether you were born and raised in a church and got saved at four as I did, or whether you weren't born and raised in the church and you didn't get saved till you were 40 or whatever, uh, we're saved by what Christ did, not by what we did. But we can look, the Scripture says, at one another and not judge, and we'll talk about that too, but there's a sense of which if you look at somebody's life and every time they open their mouth it's perverse, then you know that's not Christ. It's not a point of judging, it's just a point of saying, you know, where is it? Perversity does not come from, from the Lord. And so, yes, you, just as you can identify a tree, Jesus said, by its fruit, so you can identify people by their actions. Colossians, we talked about that last week, not going to repeat it. The fruit of the f flesh, which is carnality, and the, the fleshliness, and the fruit of the spirit, which is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, moderation or temperance against which there is no law. Uh, and then we come down to the real proof. How many of you really want to know if you look like a Christian of the world? Raise your hand. Somebody say, I'm a little afraid. Don't be. Don't be. Okay. What's the proof that we're Christians? Here it is. It's, in fact, we had communion this morning. It's Monday, Thursday evening, over 2,000 years ago. Jesus is meeting with the disciples. And as he meets with the disciples, he's talking about the Passover and what it means and the value of the cup being his blood shed for us and the new covenant and the bread. And he goes through the whole thing with the Passover teaching with them. And then he says to them, do you want to know how people will know you're a Christian not because you go to temple, not because you come to church, not because you observe you know, communion, not because you call yourself a Christian. The proof of the pudding is in the eating. Jesus said, by this, direct quote, King James, by this shall all men know that you are my disciples, If you love one another. If you love one another. I got to tell you, 
this is the most loving church I've seen. You walk through, somebody attacks you with hugs. Love it. I'd be upset if you didn't. Uh, loving towards each other. You just quietly take care of each other's needs. You just do it. It's Nike theology, right? Nike says, just do it. Shoe commercial, sneaker commercial. Just do it. Your love for one another will prove to the world that you are my disciples. That's what Jesus said. Am I always loving? Next question. <laughs> Probably not alone in that, but uh, doesn't make it any better. Let me ask you this. Am I far more loving extendedly than I was five years ago, 10 years ago, 15 years ago, 20 years ago? Exponentially so. Am I growing into the image of Christ who is love? Yeah. Yeah. Have I arrived yet? No. Even the Apostle Paul said he hadn't arrived yet. So, your love, do you want to know if the world sees Christ in you? How loving do they see you? Uh, you know, by this shall all men know that you're my disciples if you have love one for another. Does it mean you approve of everything one another does? Does it mean necessarily that you always have to get along with everybody? I find it interesting that, that Peter said, live peaceably as much as lieth within you. There are some things you can't hold your peace at, folks. You understand what I'm saying? There are some things you can't hold your peace at. Not a matter of judgment. And that's not so much for the folks in the pews to do as it is the leadership of the church to look at situations, discern what's going on, and decide what needs to be done about that. Does that make sense? Believe me, the scripture says that those who are in spiritual leadership shall receive a harsher judgment. It means that if we mess up in leadership, God will hold us even more accountable than he'll hold you. You don't want to be held accountable for those things. You don't want to be. But it is important that your spiritual leadership stand firm and know where do we just say, okay, grace and mercy will cover that, and where do we say, mm, can't let the grace and mercy, not that grace and mercy won't, but there's a point where when you pour grace and mercy out and out and out and out and out, then you've got to draw a line. So love is the ultimate proof. Now, just before I turn this, and you try, some of you I can imagine are trying to reconcile, well, what does that mean? What that means is that sometimes the most loving thing we can do is discipline. Okay? That's what the Word says. In the Scriptures... God is quoted as saying, What son is he whom the Father hath not disciplined? And then, we're all adults here, so I'm going to say it. Then the King James Version says, If you're not disciplined by God, you're a bastard. I didn't say that. That's the King James language. It says, You are an illegitimate child. If you claim to be a believer, and you have no thought and don't care what you say or do, and you're not disciplined, then you're not a child of God. So the most loving thing that can be done is to gently, lovingly, with great care, discipline. What do you get if you don't discipline a child? A spoiled brat. Some of my kids it was easy. My son Jim, I'd just look at him across the room, raise a hairy eyeball, and he'd start to cry. And he'd go, oh, I'll behave, Dad. And one of mine who shall remain nameless, I'm going to spank the daylights out of him. He'd just sit there and laugh at me. Just sit there and laugh. 
You know, so we need just different levels of discipline for different kids. But let me tell you, you need to understand that because God loves you, he will discipline you. And if you're sitting there saying, I've never felt the discipline of God. I've never felt God go after me. Yeah, <laughs> some of you are rolling your eyes saying, yeah, I can't say that. Uh, if God loves you, he will have disciplined you and he does love you. Uh, so then we go from, from that level of discernment that the leadership has to have, and the scripture says, don't judge. That's a warning, folks. In fact, in, in um, Matthew 7, 1, it says, judge not that you be not judged, for furthermore, to the same degree and with the same measure that you judge others, you will be judged. That's scary, folks. God says, if you want to be hypercritical and mean and nasty and say things about people and just go off on them just for the sake of going off on them because you can, God says, it's coming back at you. Remember what we used to say when we were kids? We'd point a finger at somebody and they'd say, don't point that at me. You've got three pointed back at you. Remember that? Here's the three pointed back at me. Any of you ever heard that when you were kids? Okay, Brian did. All right. Uh, Whatever attitude you have towards others, if it's not wrapped in love, it's coming back at you. So don't do that. Don't do that to yourself, let alone to anybody else. Love yourself enough not to do that to others so it doesn't come back at you. Judge not that you be not judged. 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 12. So if, big if, there's that if again, John. So if, you think you're standing. I'm doing pretty good these days, folks. I'm looking a lot like Jesus. He says, if you think you're standing, take, that's pride, take heed. Because you are about one trip away from a fall. And it'll come quick because the scripture says, and it seems like we just finished the book of James a little bit ago, Josh. <laughs> what does James say? Pride goeth before a fall. God raises up those who are humble, and he puts down those who refuse to be humbled. Sometimes folks get disciplined because they just refuse to be humbled on their own. Folks, you got a choice. You can choose to walk in humility, or you can wait until God puts you down. One way or the other, it's going to happen. Does that make sense? So let's choose to walk in humility ourselves. Make the choice that's just smart to walk in humility. Matthew 13.10. You know, sometimes we get, well, I, I don't think they're saved. Or I don't. You know what? That's not even the pastor's job to decide are they saved or aren't they saved. If they're walking outside of God's will... And you don't hear the right things. Even I, at that point, I, I'm not, it's not my choice. Not my, I don't have the authority to judge whether they're saved or not. I know we're called to be fruit inspectors. By their fruit, you shall know them. But some people, they're just a, a, a little thin line from fruit inspectors to judges. And uh, uh, it's not my play. As, as a leader, sometimes I don't have an option but to move when God prayerfully leads me to do that. On the other hand, on the other hand, I can't judge. You say, is this person saved when they do that or that? Or that? I don't know. Jesus said, you leave the wheat and the tares. Tares just means weeds. You leave the wheat and the tares growing together, and in the end in the harvest, that's when Jesus comes back, he said, I'll straighten it out. I'll figure out who is. Because there's going to be some folks you're going to look at and say, man, that, that person was never born again. And you're going to get to heaven and find out, mm, yeah, they were. Maybe they were carnally minded, but they made it to heaven. And then there's going to be some people who are really good people, and you're going to think, oh, they're going to be in heaven. You get there, never surrendered their life to Christ, and they weren't saved. We don't know. Not even as a pastor would I even begin to make that distinction one way or the other. Uh, five things very quickly. Uh, 
If you're a member of the body of Christ, how do you show that through love? I'm going down through these verses, and I'm, and I'm just, as I always do, the Holy Spirit says, use this verse, use this verse, use this verse. Didn't dawn on me till I'm down through four out of the five, and every single one of them says, in love. Never noticed that till I'd already written them down. I was looking at what does God ask us to do towards other believers. Be devoted to one another, Romans 12.10. Be devoted. Wow. We talk about, maybe we don't today, but I used to talk about, and I still call them devotions. I have devotions in the morning. I have devotions at night. And there are certain things I do in certain passages I, re I read or, or devotional readings that I read. And, and I'm literally saying to the rest of the world, if the phone rings, you know, I'm not going to answer that until I'm done devoting to God. Because I can't have the strength and the wisdom I need to meet your needs until I've heard from God and given Him the glory and the honor that belongs to Him. So I'll take that time in the morning uh, and then again before bedtime. But then use that same word to be devoted to one another. You folks don't even seem to have to ask one another. You just say, well, you know, somehow I've got to get to the doctor. They say, oh, I'll take you. That's devoted. That's devoted. To, uh, to pray for one another is a devotion. It takes time to pray. It takes faith to pray. Honor one another. You notice these also say, all say one another. Honor one another. The opposite of honoring them is it's all about me, all about what I want, what I think, what I need, what I want to do. Honoring one another is, what do you need? What can I do? How can I lift you up? You know, how can I bring honor to you? Honor one another. And then what it says? In love. Not because you're, you're, you're looking to get a payback as they honor you, as you honor them, they'll honor you. Mm -mm. It says, you in love give them the honor that, that God wants them to have. Serve one another humbly. Serve one another humbly in love. Galatians 5.13 Serve. What can I do for you? New Testament epistles teach us that whether you're the employer or the employee, serve one another. Whether you're the husband or the wife, serve one another. And then as if that's not enough, he says, do it in love too. Oh boy. Love too? Okay. Next one, fourth one. Spur one another on. There's that one another. How do you show love? Well, you can't show love. I, I mean, I do know that we're, Christ told us to love, love one another as we love ourselves. So, yeah, we've got to love ourselves. And if you don't know how to love yourself, you can't love anybody else. But that doesn't mean make yourself a god, you know, that you worship and every need that you have you meet and ignore everybody else's. But it says encourage one one another. All of these are a one another, which means if you want to know if your love is real and your Christianity is real, go look for the one another's that you're ministering to. Start in your home with your husband, your wife, your kids, your neighbors. You know, Spur one another on. Encourage one another in love. The last one there is I think there's a reason, and before I just say that, there's a reason why God gave us two ears and one mouth. I have a tough time with this one. I confess it. You know, I'm a preacher by trade, you know, by calling, and so I find it easy to talk. As a counselor, I find it easy to listen. But as a friend, sometimes I find it hard to shut up and listen. You know, it's just part of who I am, and it may decry a level of immaturity I don't want to admit to, but it may be there. So at any rate, but he says, if you have to speak, if God doesn't give you an option, then speak the truth in love. doesn't say, speak the truth and God told me to tell you. Oh, no. 
Oh no. Speak the truth in love. Wow. This one and one more and we're done. And they're real short. This is to continue what? Measuring ourselves in love. Measuring our Christianity in terms of love. How long do we do that? This is to continue until... This is a gotcha. Until we all come together in such unity of faith and the knowledge of God's Son that we will be mature... What are we aiming for? We're measuring our Christianity in terms of maturity. And how do we measure our maturity? By love. He says, you keep on doing that until when? When is enough? Oh, until we measure up to the full and complete standard of Christ. When you look just, when I look just like Jesus... Then we can think about coasting a little bit. I don't think we'll want to at that point. But he says, if you want to know if your love is is mature, then ask yourself, when the world looks at me, do they see Jesus perfectly? Not yet. Not yet. Still working on it, John. When we measure up to the full and complete standard of Christ's character, then, and only then, can we say, well, maybe I can rest on my laurels a little bit and, and uh, you know, not work so hard at loving. Until then, we need to fight the battles in here that keep us from loving those who are sometimes the most unlovely. It's easy to love people who are lovely. It's easy to love people who are loving. Not so easy to love those who are mean, ornery, unloving, unkind. And they may very well be the people who need the love of Christ the most. Last one. Close with this. Hebrews 10, 25. So we're loving. We're being formed and conformed into the image of Christ. Our spiritual maturity is being measured by whether or not we look like Jesus when we love and the quality of our love. And he says, how do we do that? Well, the last thing he says, is actually the first verse we looked at in this whole series where it says, Paul and Barnabas assembled themselves together with the church. And this says, so forsake not, do not neglect our meeting together as some people are doing I don't need to judge anybody. I just look at more wood than I've ever seen before in a long time in this church. And I know sometimes we're forsaking the assembling of ourselves together. We can blame in a whole bunch of reasons as to why, but the reality is everybody makes choices. Part of those choices is, Will I obey the scriptures, which says, forsake not the assembling of yourselves together as the manner of some is. And even more so, that passage says, as you see the day of Christ's return approaching. How many of you think the day of Christ's return is approaching fast? Then of all the times you might have chosen to not come to church, don't let it be now. Okay, why? Why? I need what you have. You encourage me when you come to church. Hopefully, as your pastor, I encourage you when you come. Hopefully. If I don't, we need to talk. You know, feel free to come have a sit down with me. But encourage one another, especially as you see that day of Christ's return drawing near. It's a whole lot easier to respond with love when we get together as the body because you know what? You are by spiritual nature, as the flock of God at Portland, you tend to be very loving and gracious. You really do. Uh, And you need to know that and you need to know I genuinely believe that. And when you come together, you're inspired to do more of that. 
When you separate yourself and you start facing the hardships of life and there's nobody there and you don't feel like people are encouraging you, it may be because you've withdrawn yourself without even intending to. I'm going to say one of the most unusual and maybe unspiritual things you'll ever hear me say. I think church is a habit. If we're in the habit, it's easy to come to church. I don't have any spiritual battles getting out of bed in the morning. You know? But if you miss a week, and then you miss two, and then you miss three, and then you miss four, all of a sudden, I don't know, it's raining out, and do I, do I, you know? I know church is a habit. Stay in the habit. Why? For your sake. And I close with this. I believe, I genuinely believe, that the church, the New Testament church, is the New Testament equivalent to the Ark of the Covenant in the Old Testament. Remember, not the Ark of the Covenant, the Noah's Ark in the Old Covenant, in the Old Testament. Remember Noah's Ark? God was going to judge the world, and he did. And Noah preached for a hundred years and nobody listened. And the only a hundred years it took him to build the ark. Read the scriptures. A hundred years. And nobody listened. And the only ones on that ship, other than the animals, were Noah and his three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth, and their wives. Only ones on the ship out of all of humanity. And when the rains came down and it destroyed them all and they were all judged. Folks, there is coming a judgment on this earth. Just know it. As much as there was in the days of Noah, there's coming a judgment. You know, you could have said, I'm not getting on that ark. It's going to be stinky. Whoo! There's going to be some rare, unusual critters. Well, there is in church, too. <laughs> Starting with a guy up front. And I know, I know. Church may be stinky, and it may have some rare critters. And it may not always be perfect, and you may not always like what you see in church, but it's the only boat afloat. Amen. Stay in church, folks, for your sake. For your sake. And as we learn to love each other here amidst the stink and the rare critters and all the rest that goes with it, as we learn to love one another, we will become more like Christ. And he'll be happy with us. And we'll be happy with ourselves. Amen?